So, it's October 22nd, and you've just received your ballot for BC's electoral reform referendum. And you think to yourself, holy smithers, how the fuck am I supposed to sort this all out before my ballot's due on November 30th? If only I hide a helpful video somewhere that could help sort it all out, then I'd be golden. Well, worry no more. This is This Year Vancouver. My name's Josh Mesmer, and my mission is to have this explained. BC's electoral reform referendum. So let's start with the very basics. We all get that we're voting on something, but on what exactly? Well, it's all about the system that we use to elect our provincial government here in BC. Basically, what will our ballots look like on voting day, and how will our votes be translated into seats in our legislature, the big room in Victoria where everyone yells at each other. The referendum will have no effect on your city council elections and no effect on Canada-wide elections. This is all and only about British Columbian elections. And the referendum itself is actually quite simple. There's only two questions. Number one, would you like to keep our current first-past-the-post system, or would you like to use a proportional representation system? And number two, if we change to a proportional system, which of these three versions do you prefer? Dual member, mixed member, or rural urban? Simple. Except, what the hell's gate are those systems? First past the post. Put very simply, first past the post just means that the very first person to pass the post, or the percentage at which they need to win more votes than anyone else, wins. It's quick, simple, and easy to understand. When you go to vote on election day, you very clearly understand the system. If more people vote for my candidate than people vote for any of the others, then my candidate wins because majority rules. This process is then played across two levels. First, between individual candidates within a single riding, and then second, between parties across the whole province. After all the votes are counted, the individual that wins a greater number of votes in your riding than anyone else wins that riding. Then, whichever parties won the greatest amount of ridings get to form government. This can either be a single party, like when the Liberals won a majority of seats in 2013, or it can be a partnership between multiple parties, like in 2017 when the NDP and Greens combined their 41 plus 3 ridings to gain a one-seat majority. This system is well-liked and well-used because it does a pretty good job at balancing localized representation with province-wide representation. Each riding has a single representative, so you know what they stand for and who you need to contact. The ridings are also small, so your representative is usually part of your community. The system also favors larger parties, we'll talk about why soon, which allows for strong majority governments to be more common. This allows ruling parties to be more efficient and quick, because no other party can veto them, which a lot of people like. What happens if the person who wins your writing isn't someone that you voted for? What if there's someone that you entirely disagree with? Well, then you're stuck, because you only have a single representative and there's no one else to turn to. And what if a contentious issue isn't region-based, but divides the entire province? Sometimes, local representation is great. It allows an area to get its fair share of voice. But what if that area is disunited on the issue? They still only get one vote in the legislature to represent both viewpoints. And sometimes, a majority government might not be such a good idea. If a party has 60% of the seats, they have 100% of the power to make decisions that match their viewpoint, even though 40% of the seats disagree with them. Instead, a system that created minority governments would force people with differing views to work together. A minority government might be more fair, but it could also be disorganized and unprincipled. There's also the problem that, maybe, giving the riding to the first person to get a majority isn't as fair as it sounds. Just look at the riding of Courtney Comox. The NDP won the most amount of votes in 2018 here, so they won the riding and get to use all of its votes in the legislature. But the NDP only won 37.4% of people's votes. The majority of people, more than 60%, voted for someone other than the NDP. But in First Past the Post, the NDP still get 100% of the power in the riding, with less than 40% of the support. This is good, because you won't have lots of small parties forcing out crazy ideas into the legislature. But bad, because most people don't have any representation of their views. Even when people win a majority of the votes across the province, it still might not be fair. In the 2001 BC election, the Liberals won a majority of votes, 57%. But in the legislature, that translated to 97% of the seats leaving the other 43% of voters who didn't vote for the Liberals completely voiceless. And so, this is most people's greatest problem with First Past the Post. Again, it's really good at a lot of things. Its ability to provide local representatives that live close to everyone in their riding is really good. Its ability to create strong, unified legislatures is really good. Plus, it's really easy to understand, which simplifies the democratic process and makes democracy more accessible for everyone. But for a lot of people, its inability to have the percentage of seats in the legislature reflect the percentage of votes is absolutely unacceptable. So what do these naysayers propose as a solution? Well, it's called proportional representation because it tries to make the percentage of seats that each party wins equal to, or proportional to, the percentage of votes that they win. 
let's take a look at each system one by one. Dual member, mixed member, and urban rural. Let's start with dual member proportional. Like the name would suggest, the dual member system tries to make the results more proportional to the popular vote by giving each riding two, or dual, MLAs. We currently have 87 MLAs, and under this new system, there would be no more than 95. So in order to have twice as many MLAs per riding, most ridings are going to have to double in size. This is except for the very large, sparsely populated ridings, like Stekine, but most other ridings will double in size. This means that your representation will be a little less local, but it won't be that different. Instead of having one representative for Surrey Guildford, you'll have two reps for Guildford and Fleetwood, which are barely different. To help illustrate how this will work, I think it'll be best to run through a mock election. Let's pretend that we're electing 100 MLAs, just to keep the math nice and simple. That'll mean that there are about 50 ridings. So, it's election day, and we show up at our local polling station, and we get handed a ballot. These new ballots are almost entirely the same as our current ballots. We're only allowed to give a single vote, and all of our options are either an independent, so we just see their name, or they're a member of one of the parties, so we see the party name next to theirs. The only difference with these new ballots is that some parties will have two candidates that we can vote for at the same time. They're not separate options though, they're both listed beside the same checkbox. I'll explain how this works soon. So now let's pretend that we voted, and that all the votes have been counted. The results for our writing only are, the Star Wars party won with 40% of the vote, the Nintendo party came next with 30% of the vote, and the Hogwarts party came in third with 26% of the vote. The Mad Max party also comes in at just 4%. So, how do we decide who gets to take the two seats for this riding? Well, the Star Wars party won the most votes, so their first candidate, Leia, wins the first seat. This is exactly how the first-past-the-post system works, so it's nice and familiar. The second seat works a little differently, though. To understand this, we first have to see who won the other seats. Remember, right now we're only looking at the first seats in every riding because that's all that's been decided so far. So, let's say that of these first 50 seats, the Star Wars party won the most seats across the province with 30. Hogwarts won 15, and Nintendo won 5. If we do the math, that's 60, 30, and 10% of the seats. If we compare this to the total percentage of votes that they earned, we'll see that, like in First Past the Post, the seat to vote ratio is not proportionally 1 to 1. It's unequal. The lowest scoring party, the Mad Max party, won 2% of the votes, but no seats. With 2% of the votes, they should proportionally get 1 out of 50 seats, but they didn't. For most other parties, we're going to even this out, but under the dual member system, we won't actually do anything to fix this for a party as small as the Mad Max party. In order to get any of the second 50 seats, they need to get at least 5% of the votes, and they only got 2. This is a failsafe to keep fringe extremist parties with little support from having any influence in our legislature. So, if we ignore the 2% of votes that Mad Max got, we see that the rest of the popular vote works out to leave the Star Wars party with 45% of the votes, the Hogwarts party with 30, and the Nintendo party with 25% of the votes. That means that if the seats were proportional, the Star Wars party, out of 100 seats, should get 45, the Hogwarts party should get 30, and the Nintendo party should get 25. We'll achieve this number by giving them the necessary share of the next 50 seats that haven't been won yet. So, let's do the math. The Star Wars party needs a total of 45 seats, minus the 30 that they already won with their first candidates, which equals 15 more seats. Hogwarts needs 30, minus their already earned 15, for a total of 15 more seats. And Nintendo, 25, minus their current 5, for a total of 20 additional seats. So you can see from these numbers that Nintendo is getting the greatest amount of secondary seats in order to properly even out their representation in the legislature. But they'll still have the lowest total number of seats because they won the lowest percentage of votes. So now, if we look at the legislature, the percentage of votes that each party won is equal to the percentage of seats that they won. But wait, which candidate from each party gets those seats? Simple, the candidate of that party, not including the ones that already won a seat, that got the highest percentage of the vote. Before we do that though, Let's look at what happened to the second Star Wars candidate in our writing. So, if we remember correctly, in our writing, Star Wars got 40%, Nintendo won 30%, and Hogwarts won 25 So, Star Wars' first candidate, Leia, got the first of two seats. But what happens to the second candidate, Boba Fett? Well, he gets half of the votes that the Star Wars party won, or 20%. It doesn't have to be one half, it could be a quarter, or two thirds, or two percent, whatever. But the vanilla version of this system is one half. Shy Guy won as Nintendo's first candidate in this other riding with 80% of the votes. His second candidate, Goomba, is then allocated 40% of the votes. So, now that we've crossed the first winning candidates off our list and allocated the second candidates of winning parties their proper share of the votes, we can find out who gets what seat. So let's sort all of the party's candidates by their best performers. 
Star Wars and Hogwarts can give seats to their top 15 remaining candidates, and Nintendo can give seats to their top 20. Sometimes, these candidates are going to be in the same riding, which means that they can't both get elected, because there's only one more seat available there. There are two ways to deal with this. We can go one party at a time, or we can rotate around the parties. If we go one party at a time, the Star Wars party will get all their top 15 candidates elected. Then, if the Hogwarts party has any conflicts, those candidates would be eliminated, and they'd pull from further down on the list. The same will be repeated for the Nintendo party. If instead we rotate around the parties, we go Star Wars top candidate, Hogwarts top candidate, Nintendo top, Star Wars second, Hogwarts second, Nintendo second, on and on and on, until it would end with Nintendo's 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. Again, if there are any conflicts, like if Nintendo's 9th conflicted with Hogwarts 12th, we just eliminate the 12th, and Hogwarts would push everyone up the list. It's not exactly clear which of these two methods we'd be using, but they're both pretty similar. Okay, so there is one more caveat here. In some cases, where the person to win the second most amount of votes in a riding is an independent, they would automatically win the second seat. This is because they don't belong to a party, so even though they won a large share of the votes, they have no chance to win any of the proportional seats, because that's calculated with a party's performance across the whole province. This sounds like a fair compromise to me, but to some people it might seem like an unfair advantage for independence. In BC, there would also be some ridings again, like Stakhein, that were already too large to double in size, and so instead of electing two candidates, they only get to elect the first, and not a proportional filler candidate. So in urban and semi-urban ridings, you'd elect the person with the most votes, plus a proportional filler, and in the large rural ridings, you'd just elect the person with the most votes, exactly as we already do. Dual number proportional is really good at avoiding all of the problems that we discussed about first past the post, where you didn't actually need that many votes to win government, and even if you won a lot of votes, you might not have won many seats. With dual member, you win just about the same share of seats as you do the share of votes. Because of this, smaller parties will typically win more seats than they did under first past the post, which means that minority governments are also more common. Again, this means more cooperation and less absolute power for a single ideology, but it also means more disorder and less efficiency. So take your pick here. Dual member is also really good in that it's pretty simple to use from a voter's perspective. They don't really have to change anything, they still go in on voting day and vote for a single party, with the candidate's name beside the party name. Nothing new or confusing. This is unlike the next system that we're going to look at, which requires you to give two votes. This is mixed member proportional. Like the name suggests, it mixes two different votes together. One is for a local representative in your riding, and the other is for a party. It's possible that these two votes will be combined, so that a vote for Iron Man counts as both your local vote and your vote for Marvel. Or, more likely, they'll be properly separated, so that you'll be able to vote for your local representative and your party separately. Like, if you really like Batman locally, but prefer the Marvel party overall. Unlike with dual member and mixed member, only one candidate can stand beside each tick box. But the way that the votes are then counted is very similar to dual member. Just like dual member in First Past the Post, in Mixed Member, the candidate that won more votes in the riding than anyone else wins that riding. The difference between these two proportional systems is in how they try to make the results proportional. In Mixed Member, individual ridings are grouped into larger regions. These regions haven't been defined yet, so it's hard to tell exactly how large it'll be. A region could be as large as Pemberton to Hope, or it could be in the middle at about the size of Metro Vancouver. Or they could be pretty small, like a Surrey Delta region. There's nothing absolute yet. Then, unlike in dual member, the proportional members aren't allocated as the second representative of each riding, but are rather elected as regional MLAs that represent all of the ridings in the region. This will also be different than dual member, because instead of having half of the MLAs being the candidate with the most votes and the other half of candidates being proportional fillers, at least 60% of the MLAs here would be directly responsible to specific ridings, while at most, 40% only would be responsible to the regions as a whole as proportional fillers. Because of this, the ridings in mixed member will be able to be a little bit smaller and more local than the ridings in dual member, although to make room for the regional MLAs, the ridings will still have to be a little larger and more general than under first past the post. These regional proportional MLAs can get selected in three possible ways. No specific way has been selected yet, so you won't know until or if it gets implemented. The first method is called closed list. This means that before the election, each party publishes a numbered list of all their candidates. After the election happens, they cross out all the names of the MLAs who already won a riding. Then, we calculate what percentage of votes each party won with the second vote. And then, using a similar method to the one in dual member, we decide how many of the remaining seats each party should get in order to make the total number of seats proportional. Once we know this, the party gets to elect the members from the published list in descending order until they run out of seats. A lot of people don't like this, because they feel it gives the party a lot of power over who gets to sit in government, and that's true. 
It does. But you should also remember that you get to elect individual candidates with your first vote, and it's really important to realize that in our current system, the parties are already deciding who gets to run for them in your riding before you even get to vote. This list of members isn't really all that different, and even allows you to get a behind the scenes look at who's really running the show in the party. The second method for deciding who gets the proportional seats is called open list. This system will list all of the candidates in your region and allow you to give a single vote to your favorite individual. The party then uses the number of votes that each candidate got to rank their top candidates from each region. If any of them get elected from the first vote, they're again removed from the list and everyone else gets shuffled up. This system allows you to take back that little extra bit of power that the parties get with the closed version. But sadly, if you like mixed member proportional, you won't get to vote on which of these systems will be used. There's also a third method, which is a combination of the two. It would simply allow you to either vote for an individual or vote in favor of the party's already existing list. If the party list gets more votes than any individual candidate, they'll just use the list. If one individual gets more votes than the list, they'll just put them at the top of the list, and then after they're elected, use the pre-made list as usual. And again, if you're voting for mixed member proportional, you're voting for the possibility of any of these three systems. They're really not all that different though, so I don't think it's too much of a problem, but you could totally think that there's too much of a gray area for your own comfort. All right, this video is getting really long and my voice is starting to hurt, so let's move on to the last, but certainly not least, rural urban. This one is actually a mix of two systems as well, except in this system, each riding only gets to use one system each. The first of the two systems is actually just mixed member proportional, which is what will be used in larger rural ridings. In these ridings, the votes counting representation will work exactly like how I just described mixed member to work. In the urban and semi-urban ridings, on the other hand, we'll be using a system called single transferable vote, or STV. It'll vary from riding to riding, but most ridings will be larger than they are right now, and will have several representatives each, sometimes with multiple candidates running for the same party. So, how do these votes work? Well, in short, when you show up to vote, instead of checking off a single candidate, you get to rank them in numbered order. So, if you only like the Hogwarts party and hate all the others, you can check off their name and leave the rest blank. Or, if you like all of the fantasy parties, you can rank them all, like this, so that if the Hogwarts party doesn't win, your vote will just get passed on to your second choice. That way, you don't have to fear about throwing away or splitting your vote. Let's go over a very simple example. Let's pretend that in this riding, there can only be one winner. Usually there will be several, but let's just keep things simple for now. Because there is only one winner, the amount of votes that you'll need to get in order to win the seat is going to be 50%. If there were multiple candidates, this quota might be a little lower, but again, we won't worry about that right now. So let's say we've all voted, and the votes have come in like this. The Star Wars party gets 30% of the votes, the Hogwarts party gets 25, the Nintendo party gets 25, and the Middle Earth party gets 20. So far, no party has reached the 50% quota, so no one's won. But that's okay, because most people ranked their ballots, so we still have votes to redistribute. The Middle Earth party got the least amount of votes, so they'll get eliminated in this first round. We'll move all of their second rank votes to the next candidate for the second round. Most of the Middle Earth voters liked the Hogwarts party the second best, so most of their votes go there. Not everyone's the same though, so some of them also voted for the other two parties. After the redistribution, the results are Hogwarts 40, Star Wars 33, and Nintendo 27. So we'll go to the next lowest candidate, which is the Nintendo party. For the small portion of Middle Earth voters whose second vote went here, we'll move on to their third ranked candidate. Most of them voted for Hogwarts here. If they didn't rank a third candidate, we just throw out their ballot at this point. Then, all of the people who first voted for Nintendo will now have their second votes redistributed. After this redistribution, we see that the Hogwarts party has passed the threshold at 57%, while the Star Wars party is finished with 43%. So, the Hogwarts party wins this seat in the third round. You'll notice that under first past the post, the Star Wars party would have won this riding. But, by asking voters for all of their choices, we can see that, even if they weren't their first choice, a majority of voters would actually prefer the Hogwarts party, and only a minority actually wanted the Star Wars party. This allows us to elect the most popular candidates across all voters, instead of the candidate with a slightly larger share of first voters. If we were in a riding with two seats available, the Star Wars party would also end up winning a seat, because after redistribution, they were still in the final two. If we were in a riding with three seats, the Nintendo party would also get a seat, because they made it into the final three. When there is more than one seat available like that, most parties will choose to run more than one candidate. That way, they have a chance of winning both seats. And they don't have to worry about splitting their votes, because their lowest scoring candidate will eventually have most of their votes redistributed, redistributed, redistributed to their other candidate. I really hope this is all making sense. If you're confused about any of these systems, you can always go back and rewatch all of the sections, and even better, I'll try to answer any questions that you may have in the comments down below. 
It might also help to get a second perspective on these systems, so in the description down below I've linked to a playlist of videos by CGP Grey, which are probably the penultimate videos on YouTube for understanding electoral systems. Okay? Okay. Let's compare all of the systems one more time. If you really like the idea of having a very small riding where your MLA is very local to you, you might want to support First Past the Post, because it's going to have the smallest ridings. With dual member, most ridings are going to get close to doubling in size, and with rural urban, some of the urban ridings might even get bigger than that. None of the ridings are likely to get any bigger than your city as a whole though, so none of the systems are that bad for local representation. Of all the proportional systems though, I think that mixed member is the best for local representation, because it allows you to have two votes. So you can still vote for your favorite party, but if there's also a local candidate that you really like from a different party, you can vote for them too. If you think that it's important for the ballots to be as simple and easy to understand as possible, then both first past the post and dual member proportional are really good choices for that. Both only need a single vote on the paper. Most of the mixed member systems require two votes, which for local representation is a plus, but especially with open list systems can get pretty complicated. Rural urban is a little simpler, but in urban writings you're going to be able to rank candidates, which can get a little confusing. If you really do like this ability to rank your ballots though, so that you can be sure your vote doesn't get wasted or split, then rural urban is your best and only option. Just be sure to remember that you only get ranked ballots in urban areas, so if you're in a rural riding, you're out of luck all round. If you really like the idea of a strong majority government that can get things done quickly, then first past the post is the best choice. The other systems can result in majority governments, but it's less common. If you don't like the idea of a single party having all the power, and would prefer more debate and compromise on issues, you'll probably prefer any of the proportional systems, because they usually result in minority governments. First past the post can result in minorities too, but here it's more rare. If you care about parity between the percentage of votes and the percentage of seats that each party wins, you're going to want to vote for any of the proportional systems. First past the post isn't awful, it's not like you're going to get any inverted results, but the proportional systems are far better here. If you want the candidate that the most amount of people will be okay with to win, you should vote for rural urban, because the ranked ballots are the best way to discern that. If instead you want the candidate that is the most people's first choice to win, you should vote for the other three, because that's how those systems work. If you don't like the idea of the party creating their own ranked list of candidates that will get seats, then you shouldn't vote for mixed member or rural urban if you live in a rural area. In the other three systems, first past the post, dual member, and urban ridings in rural urban, all the candidates that win seats are the most popular candidates that election, although they all calculate that slightly differently. Again, just remember that in all the systems, the parties are pre-selecting who gets to run in all of the ridings before you get a chance to vote, so there's kind of a list in all systems anyway. Alright, so you can look at this chart and decide which features are more or less important to you, and use that to decide your favorite system. If you decide that first past the post is your favorite system, you should vote for first past the post in the first question on the ballot, and then you can rank the proportional systems from your least hated to your most hated. These rankings will then be counted up the exact same way as the candidates are in rural urban. If you like all of the proportional systems, you should vote for proportional on the first ballot question, and then rank the proportional systems from your most favorite to your least favorite. If you only like one or two of the proportional systems and hate the others, you have a couple choices. You can vote for proportional on the first question, and then only rank the ones that you like on the second question, and then hope that the version that you dislike doesn't win. But if you really hate one of the proportional systems and really don't want to take a chance with it, it's possible that, even though you really do like the other two proportional systems, you don't want to take the risk on the third one, and so you just vote for first past the post. If you do so, you can still rank your favorite options in the second question. I wouldn't recommend this method and would say that if you like any proportional system, you should just take the risk, but it's worth noting that this is an option for you anyway. I hope that this all makes sense, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments down below, or take a look at some of the resources that I've linked in the description. If you enjoyed this, the absolute best thing that you can do to help is to share this video on social media, and I also have a Patreon if you want to and can afford it. I've also started up an Instagram page, so if you post your Vancouver photos with the hashtag ThisYearVancouver, I'm going to start posting some of those up there. And with that, I'll see you guys again in October for Vancouver Municipal Election Overview. Thanks again.